Hello everybody, this is Scott from Nostalgic Nightmares and welcome to my review of Goosebumps number 7, Night of the Living Dummy. And this is my first review of from the original series so I'm quite excited to uh, start talking about these because for anyone who's not listened to any of my channel before, uh, I started doing these reviews because I did see people on YouTube reviewing Goosebumps as adults when they'd read them as a kid as well. So it kind of inspired me to do something similar but I've put off doing the original series until now purely just to try and do some different series so if you've ever read Ghost of Fear Street or Shivers or the Goosebumps Horrorland series please check out some other videos on my channel because I've started reviewing those as well. I actually chose to review this one in particular um, for a couple of reasons. One because Slappy is obviously iconic in the Goosebumps land uh, but also with me reviewing Revenge of the Living Dummy I thought it'd be interesting to go back to the beginning and see kind of how it all started but also with the new series coming out next year the slappy world i'd like to be able to buy that as it comes out rather than like years later like i have with the horror land so i thought if i start reading some more of the slappy books now when slappy world does come out and then i can review it then i'm probably in like a better place to judge it in terms of how it works as a series on its own if that makes any sort of sense so yeah, and uh, as well for anybody who's not listened to my channel before, um, Goosebumps for me is my childhood. I grew up on it, I watched all the episodes, I taped all the episodes on VCR, I had all the books, I had computer games, board games, uh, memorabilia, I had loads of stuff. It was me and my best friend were just obsessed with it. And uh, yeah, it was just everything to me, so reading them again as an adult is kind of make me look at them in a whole new light, which in some ways is a good thing. In some ways it's been a little disappointing. <laughs> Not necessarily with Goosebumps, but some of the books I've reviewed so far are a little uh, up and down. I say up and down is probably the best word to use. <laughs> so yeah, that's going to get straight into this one. It is 134 pages and 25 chapters long. And 99% of the people listening to this will already know the entire story of the book. So I might not go into as much detail as I normally do. But I'm still going to go through it and talk about what happens. So our two main characters this time round are Chris and Lindy. And they are both twins. And I believe they're probably 12 years old and red-headed like everybody is in the Goosebump series. <laughs> um, and the twins, they do get on with each other. But they are very competitive and they like to compete and they like to kind of one-up each other. It's very typical sibling stuff. And what's good about this book in particular... Um, which I don't see in some of the other books that I've been reading, is their relationship develops a lot throughout the story. So while they start off being quite competitive, it kind of escalates and changes, and I'll talk about that more kind of as we get there. Uh, but one day they decide to go and explore the vacant lot next to where they live, and they go through the weather houses and in the garden, and there's like a big skip, and inside the skip, Lindy discovers a doll, a living, uh, a living doll, no, <laughs> a ventriloquist dummy, and immediately she falls in love with it, calls it Slappy, and uh, decides she wants to take it home and start to use it, because all 12 year old kids love ventriloquism, <laughs> but she actually gets pretty good, and this is where her relationship with Chris starts to change, Lindy gets really good at it, and even though Chris thinks well, no one wants to really see ventriloquism like we're 12 years old that's not really a thing that people are really interested in lindy starts to get more and more popular kids at school like to speak to her and listen to her show she starts to book parties as a, like a performance and gets paid for them so she starts getting this popularity which chris doesn't have and chris gets left behind so chris wants to join in and basically copy her sister and begs for her own dummy which obviously annoys lindy because it's, this is lindy's thing Something that she wanted to do, something that she decided to take control of and do for herself. And Chris has kind of piggy-packed onto that. And the parents do suggest that they share the dummy, but obviously that doesn't go down well. So Chris's dad ends up buying Lindy... No, yeah. Chris's dad ends up buying Chris her own dummy, which she calls Mr. Wood. And it's there's a few things before this point, but it's mostly after Mr. Wood appears as well that really weird stuff starts to happen. So there's things like one of the dummies hits Chris in the face, but I think it's Slappy that does that. And uh, the dummies move during the night. One day Chris wakes up and Mr. Wood is stood by the doorway wearing her clothes. Or oh, there's a point where um, 
they go upstairs to have dinner downstairs, Chris and Lindy, and they go up to the bedroom, and the dummies were left on the side by a window. But uh, this time when they get upstairs, the dummies are kind of look like they're mid-fight, like Slappy is on the floor strangling Mr. Wood. So this very strange occurrence, a series of events starts to occur where they look like they're talking, they look like they're moving, they look like they're attacking. And Chris doesn't really know what to believe. Because even though we've got two main characters, we kind of focus more on Chris than Lindy, for the most part. Um... Because Lindy's the one that kind of disappears and becomes popular, whereas we focus more on Chris's jealousy. And even though there is a point where Chris gets so jealous, but then she gets her own doll, Lindy then gets jealous as well because she's like, well, this is my thing. Why is she getting the opportunity to do it as well? Lindy does actually start to help Chris and start to teach her how to kind of throw her voice more, how to keep her mouth shut a bit more so it's less obvious that she's talking. So the relationship is really back and forth between the jealousy the support, the jealousy again. And in the midst of all this, this strange stuff starts to happen. And no one's admitting it. No one's admitting that they're doing it. Everyone's just saying, we're not really sure what's going on, but they're very suspicious of each other. And then start to kind of believe that the dolls are doing it, but they've never got any proof for that. And uh, because they're getting better at their performances... They both start getting different, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Different kind of recognition. So even Chris starts booking like talent shows and things like that. Whereas Lindy, I think, bumps into the right person and is now going to go on to like a television show. And it's all very, going really well for both of them. Even though it's pointed out throughout that Lindy is actually better at it than Chris is. Chris is still quite rough around the edges, whereas Lindy picks it up quite easily, she can throw a voice quite easily and keep her mouth shut, she can come up with really good jokes, whereas Chris has to get them all from like joke books. They're both actually starting to get some form of success from the ventriloquism and kind of ignore the weird stuff that goes on around it until one night Chris goes downstairs to get a drink from the kitchen and uh, Lindy hears Chris screaming so she runs downstairs and runs into the kitchen and in the middle of the kitchen there's just mess like everywhere like the fridge is open there's food that's been thrown out there's milk all over the floor basically all the food and drinks just been kind of destroyed and in the middle of all the mess is mr wood and he's just sat there wearing the jewelry and it's at this point where the parents or the mum in particular gets up sees what's going on after hearing the commotion and goes kind of through the roof i was going to swear then but i won't because i know the new <laughs> the new youtube rules are that if you swear you 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 don't get monetized, even though I don't really get much money from these videos. I kind of just do it as a hobby. I just feel like I should try and stick to the rules just in case. Uh, bloody YouTube. Oops. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. so the mum finally sees that there's something going on. Even though they have spoke to her in the past and said, look, there's all this weird stuff going on with the dummies. Obviously, the mum, being a typical Goosebumps parent, kind of goes, well, there's, it's a dummy. There's nothing going on. Shut up. Go back to bed. But at this point she sees that something's happened and obviously she believes it's one of the girls that have done it and demands that she doesn't want to hear anything else about the dummies, she doesn't want to know anything about the dummies. They've got to clean up right now in the middle of the night, get back to bed and just sort it out. When she gets up in the morning, she wants that mess to be gone and she's not dealing with it right here and right now because it was like 3 o'clock in the morning or something random. So Chris and Lindy clean up the mess, go upstairs to their bedroom where Chris puts... Mr. Wood in the closet, where Lindy puts Slappy back in the chair in the corner, which is kind of where they live. And uh, Chris starts to get really upset at this point, because she just doesn't know what's going on. There's all this crazy stuff that's happening, things are getting destroyed, people are getting hurt, phys well, emotionally and physically to a degree, like when she got slapped. But no one's really admitted to what's going on, and she starts to get really upset, and she's kind of opening up to Lindy. And uh, she hears Mr. Wood talking in the closet, which makes her even more upset. And uh, as she's opening up to Lindy and getting quite emotional, Lindy starts to laugh. And she says, I know who's been doing it all. I know who's been doing it. And Chris is like, what? You, what who's doing it? And Lindy says, I have. <laughs> and there's your first twist of the book. All along, for the whole, I want to say at least half of the book, maybe a bit more than that. Lindy was behind everything. Every time the dummies spoke when they shouldn't have spoke, Lindy was doing it every time Chris got hit. 
Lindy did it. Lindy moved the dummies in the middle of the night. Lindy destroyed the kitchen. All along, it was Lindy. And she was doing it out of jealousy. Even when she was pretending to support Chris and teaching her on how to improve her skills and all that kind of stuff, she had an ulterior motive, which was she was going to try and act nice to her face so that when she pulls the tricks and the pranks, no one will suspect it's her. And, uh, yeah, she's just like a grade-A bitch, really. And, obviously, it rings very similar to the twist in Revenge of the Living Dummy, which, if you've not read that, spoiler alert, um, one of the cousins who comes to stay is behind all of the bad stuff that uh, Mr. Bad Boy does in that book. So, yeah, if you've read that book as well, and you know everything about this book, the book, the twist in Revenge of the Living Dummy, in hindsight, isn't as great as I thought it was at the time. Because when I read that book, I didn't see the twist coming. Whereas in this book, I didn't see it coming because I, I knew that twist happened in a different book. If that makes any sort of sense. So R.L. Stein used the same twist twice. That's like a tongue twister. Used the same twist twice. <laughs> um, which I'm not sure I'm overly happy with. But when you first read Night of the Living Dummy back in 1990, whatever. I bet that was a really great twist. I would have loved to have known how I reacted when I was a kid to the fact that holy shit like oh damn i swore again i might edit that out if i can um yeah yeah i don't know how i would have reacted to the fact that you just assume it's goosebumps one of the dummies is going to be behind it all whereas it turns out it's the sister and it's all a very human story whereas goosebumps is known for your monsters and your vampires and whatever and all that kind of stuff so this is a very human twist and in some ways that's more effective and more scary that someone that you live with and you trust is trying to hurt you. But I'll talk about that again a bit more towards the end. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to guess that Chris tells the parents about it because it kind of flashes forward a bit. And so at this point, they're not allowed to talk about the dummies. The dummies are kind of like a moot subject. They're just The parents are so angry with them both, they don't want to know. So it might just be due to the the kitchen incident, I'm not sure. But it kind of, it's worded in a way that you assume that Chris told the parents that Lindy did it all to try and hurt her, or whatever. And uh, it, there's one night where Chris is in her room, and she's playing with Mr. Wood quietly, and notices a piece of paper in his front jacket pocket. And she pulls out the piece of paper, and again, if you've read any of the Living Dummy books, you know what the paper says. And it's got some strange words on it, and she reads them out loud, and they are Karu, Mari, Adonna, Loma, Malanu, Carano. And at that point, she thinks she hears, she sees the dummy blink, but she's not overly sure. And then things start to get really strange again. And there's a point where their elderly neighbours come over to visit because they want to see the puppet show, which is a really strange timing because the parents have kind of banned the dummies, and yet... You'd think they would ask the parents first before they just showed up one night to see a show. And the parents would have turned them away, but whatever. Um, yeah, so they want to see the show. And um, I think it's Mr. Wood that does the show, or is it Slappy? No, Mr. Wood, I think. And uh, Mr. Wood starts to spout out all these horrible jokes about old people and them having yellow teeth and horrible skin. And obviously, Chris is like, well, it's not me that's doing it, it's Mr. Wood. No one believes her. Then she goes to do a school assembly where Mr. Wood starts saying horrible stuff again. And in a really weird turn of events, Mr. Wood opens his mouth and starts spewing green vomit over the first few rows of the audience. Which is something I want to talk about. I'll talk about it now, actually. I don't get how this happened. I understand. Because at this point, the dummy's alive, right? It's not a twist that anyone sees coming, uh, that you don't see coming. Especially if you've read this, reading this, uh, blah, 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 can't even talk. If you're listening to this review, you probably read the book already. Um, so Mr. Wood at this point is alive. The words that she read in his pocket brought him to life. Fine, he can move now, he can talk now, whatever. But it's never really explained about this green vomit thing. Because <clears throat> as he's vomiting on the audience, it's not just like a little bit, like a human amount of vomit or whatever. It, uh, it, so it talks about how it goes on. And on and on, and it was just like a really powerful stream that doesn't stop. And so there's more vomit that comes out of him than can physically fit inside like a, a dummy. So it's never really kind of touched upon about how that is possible. 
Mr. Wood does spout out later on that he, he has magical powers, so it may be something to do with that. But that's um, something else that I'm going to talk about, because I had a really big problem with that as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, Mr. Wood just vomits out like tons and tons and tons of green sludgy vomit stuff all over the audience. At which point Chris is pretty much almost suspended. So once again the parents are kicking off because even though no one really questions how the dummy thing happened, like my view when it would be, okay, this girl did a show and somehow used her dummy to spit green slime on the audience. Fine, I can believe that. I can believe that she would get in trouble for that. But how did they not pick up on the fact that so much stuff came spewing out of him that wasn't physically possible? Weird, weird, weird. But um, again, the parents are really, really angry and Chris is really upset. And it's at that night where things really start to kick kick into high gear. Um, Chris awakens in the middle of the night. Lindy's asleep in the bed. And she sees this figure kind of moving across the room. And she follows this figure out onto the landing. And she follows after them and turns them around, determined to see who's broken into her house, whatever. And... The person who turns around is Mr. Wood. And she stares him in the face and he speaks to her and he talks to her. And he moves. And she's freaking out because this is the first time she's finally seen face to face that the dummy is alive. Even though she should probably have known that by the fact that the dummy was talking th- through her. Or without her kind of control. And the vomit thing. This is the first time that she's been face to face with the, d- the dummy while it's moving. It does make me laugh though when I read it because... Even though I thought it was a great point in the story, it made me chuckle because if you're following a figure across the hallway and whatever, you you would know that that figure's really small and you would figure out that that's the same size as a dummy because even though they're kids, dummies are still smaller than them, so they probably would have figured out that it was a dummy. But anyway, so they finally, Chris is finally face to face with Mr. Wood and they begin to have this fight. Mr. Wood wants to leave the house and then to make Chris his slave and to make everyone in the house his slave but Chris is not in any of it so they start to have like a physical fight and they're rolling around in the hallway and they're rolling around down on the stairs a bit when the light comes on and at this point Chris is kind of sat on top of Mr Wood Lindy comes down to be like what the hell are you doing it's the middle of the night and you're rolling around with a dummy and uh, Chris is like look he's alive do you believe me do you believe me Lindy looks down and of course Mr Wood is just not moving he's just lying there uh, faking faking the fact that he's not alive. And uh, Chris gets up. Because she doesn't know what's, what's going on. Where Mr Wood bolts out from underneath her. And starts running away. And Lindy's like oh my god he's alive. And so Chris runs after him. And he's trying to grab him. And again they try and wrestle with Mr, with Mr Wood a bit. When the parents or the mum or the parents come up. And they're like what the fuck is going on. Oh, I can't stop swearing. <laughs> what the hell is going on. And uh, at this point, again, the dummy pretends to be a dummy. And even Lindy's like, look, the dummy is alive. We're fighting it. He's trying to get away. He's alive. Listen to us. The parents are getting really worried about their mental health at this point. Um, And so they kind of... I can't really remember how the parents leave it. I know they mentioned about going to the doctors, I think, in the morning, taking the kids to the doctor. Um, And that's kind of it. They kind of just go to bed (laughs) and ignore it. But um, basically, Mr. Wood tries to fight them again and says that they're going to be his slaves and nothing they can do about it. And uh, you brought the words that... uh, Yeah, he says, those are the words of the ancient sorcerer to bring me to life, not the words to kill me. Again, I have issues with that statement, but I will come back to it. Um, So they know how to wake him up, but they have no idea how to make him go to sleep again. So their only choice right now is to kill him. So they try pulling off his head or cutting off his head. It doesn't work. And then the, do- the doll threatens to kind of hurt everyone they love. They've got a family. They have a pet dog, which I've not mentioned because he doesn't really do anything until kind of the end of the book. Um, they've got a pet dog called Barky who he threatens to hurt. And says, if you don't serve me and become my slave, I'm going to hurt everyone that you love. So the kids have no choice now, but they put him in like a suitcase. And they go next door to where the vacant lot is. And they bury him in the garden because they think he's underground, he's in a locked suitcase, there's nothing you can do about it. They can't kill him because they, they can't really remove his body parts that like they've tried. And they don't have the magic words to put him to sleep. 
So the only choice is to bury him alive. So they're kind of relieved now it's all over and they go to bed. Next morning, they come, Chris comes downstairs from bed and in the kitchen, full of dirt, covered in dirt, smelling dirty, smelling horrible, is Mr. Wood. And the parents are just like, look, this has gone far enough. We're going out now because we have, to, we have somewhere to go. I can't remember where it was. Um, but we need to discuss this when I get back because it's gone too far now. The dummy is still here. It's in the kitchen. It's covered in mud. But we're leaving for now. So the parents leave, leaving Chris and then Lindy with the dummy. And the dummy's like, ha, 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 ha. You know, I told you you couldn't get away from me and all this kind of stuff. And I warned you not, not to kind of, not a bit disobey me. And someone has to be punished now. And at this point, Barky kind of runs into the room. And in a really horrible scene, Mr. Wood picks up Barky and strangles him. And I actually remember reading this part as a kid. And I got really upset reading it and I struggled. I had to like skip a couple of pages. Because I didn't want to hear about a dog being strangled. And it talks about how you can hear it yelping. And it's like painful, not screeches, but the noises that the dog's making. And you know what it's like. If anyone's ever had a dog or been near a dog, say you accidentally stand on it. Or you open a door into it. Or it kind of happens now and again because dogs run around like a lunatics. Now and again they get hurt. And the noise they make is awful it's it's heart-wrenching the yelp that comes out of them so even now when i was reading this this uh, story i struggled to read it because it i love dogs so much and hearing about this dog that's been strangled to death was just hard to read and a really dark turn in the kids book but basically skipping over that part the, the kids wrestle the dog away from slap uh, mr wood and uh oh god yeah um they wrestle them away and they pick him up by his arms and legs and next door where the vacant lot is where they buried him there's these two steamrollers that are doing something to the property and um, so they decide to go and throw him under the steamrollers and crush him because there's no other way they can see of this coming to an end so they take him outside and they go over to where the steamrollers are and as they're about to drop him in front of a steamroller barky comes running out of the house right into the to the um path of one of the steamrollers so they drop Mr. Wood, dive to where Barky is and like drag him out of the way of a steamroller. Just about saving his life. And at this point, Mr. Wood's like, ah ha ha, I have magic powers, I'm warning you, blah blah blah, blah. Shouting about like a crazy villain. And turns around to run away from them when flattened by a steamroller. Because there was two steamrollers, so he runs out of the path of one, straight into the path of another. Uh, there's a bit where the driver comes out to see what was going on because he thought it was a kid he ran over because it was clearly someone who was shouting and running but they're like oh no 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 it was just a dummy which it was just a dummy to be fair so they can believe that it mentions this like weird green gas that comes out of the dummy was it a green gas yeah a green gas that's really smelly that comes out of the dummy um, but that's it mr wood is crushed whatever gas was inside him is left and he's been destroyed and they can now go back into the house Relieved that their nightmare is over, they have to go obviously try and convince their parents that, you know, the dummy stuff's over, because at this point the parents are probably going to, like, book an appointment with a mental health specialist, but whatever. They go home, they're all relieved, they go upstairs. Is it Chris that goes upstairs? I don't know. Maybe, I think I think it's Chris, or they both go upstairs, and uh, there's an open, there's like an open window in the bedroom, so they go over to shut it. It's like the window, they mention it a few times throughout the book, so it's not really random for the sake of a cliffhanger. It is actually well put out in the book. The chair that they always put the dummies on is right underneath this window. So I want to say it's Chris walks over to the window, leans over to shut the window, when Slappy reaches up and grabs her wrist and says, Hey slave, has the other guy gone? I thought he'd never leave. And the and that is the start of the epic saga that is known as Slappy. See, that was Night of the Living Dummy. Um, oh, I've done that in about 20 minutes. Brilliant. Normally, when I do these reviews, there's still time yet, of course. But uh, it takes me about like 40 minutes to just talk about what happens in the book. So, <laughs> yay me. Um, I could have gone into a bit more detail about some of it, but you all know the story. So, you, you know what, um, what's happening in this book. Um, as you can see on the screen, for those who've never listened to me before, if there's anybody who's not listened to me before, 
Hi, thank you for tuning in. Um, the next part I talk about is the open plot points, so things that aren't really explained, things that are put in there for the sake of a story that I feel like aren't really well done. So the only two really that I don't really know about is... Again, I mentioned the slime, but there's the whole magic powers thing. I didn't touch upon it much in the story because it has no effect. But Mr. Woods says quite a few times, I have magic powers, I have magic powers. And yet doesn't do anything with them. Like, he never explains what his powers are or anything. Like, he says, I have magic powers. Doesn't move anything with his mind. Doesn't control the girls in any way. He doesn't, like, change size or appearance or anything like that. He just keeps saying, I have magic powers. But does nothing with them so whether he's just saying that to cause them kind of to kind of scaremonger them i don't know but he keeps saying it even just before he gets crushed at the end he says oh i have magic powers i have magic powers and yet they never make an appearance which is really weird for me like it's just like why would you keep putting that in the book it might explain the green slime which i mentioned earlier on but it just kind of bugged me because as far as i know forgive me if i'm wrong Slappy doesn't have magic powers. I could be completely wrong, so please don't spoil it in comments if I am. Um, but from reading this book and Revenge of the Living Dummy, from the TV episodes and from the Goosebumps movie, uh, none of them does Slappy have any powers. He may have in one of the books that I haven't read yet, I'm not sure. But uh, in none of them does he have any powers, so the whole I have magic powers really bugs me. Um, and another thing, which is kind of more of a point for Revenge of the Living Dummy rather than this book, but when Mr. Wood says, you you read the magic words that woke me up, not the words that will put me to sleep. I am 99 to 100% sure that in Revenge of the Living Dummy, it says that the same words that you used to wake them up will put them to sleep as well. Which is why the character Brittany reads them again to Slappy to make him fall asleep again. But then it turns out that it wasn't Slappy behind it all. So the words actually wake him up. I don't know for definite if that's right or not. But I'm 99% sure that's what was said in Revenge of the Living Dummy, that the same words will put them to sleep. So, whether Arostein decided to change the, the rules for the latest series, I'm not too sure. But in this book, it says that the same words that wake you up would not put you to sleep as well. So I am interested to know what those words would have been, if it's not the same words, but I don't know. It just kind of bugged me. More from reading the later book, it wasn't a problem with this book at all, in any way. It was more just a kind of a clash of um, kind of mythology, for lack of a better term, between this book and the Horrorland book. So, I don't know. But I think that's pretty much everything that's... Um, there's no other things that I don't remember making any sort of sense. We talked about the green slime. We talked about the magic powers. We don't know what the green gas was inside, but... That didn't really bother me because he can kind of, maybe it was his soul, maybe it was something to do with the green slime. That's never, but that's not really a big issue. Um, 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 yeah, I think that was all the unresolved plot points, really. Okay, on to the worst cliffhanger. I don't have the number to hand. I'll have a quick flick through while I've got it here, but I'm not sure if I'll be able to find it. Um, for me, it's just really one of the fake. Um, one of the fake outs did you know like uh, like what Goosebumps is famous for like the uh, the cliffhangers where they think something scary is happening but it's not so something jumped at me from the darkness but it turned out to be a cat or something grabbed me but it was my friend um, I think yeah chapter 4 and it ends with she had only gone one step she had only gone one step when Slappy reached up and grabbed her wrist and the next start of the next chapter, it turns out to be her sister that's done it. Um, it's not a bad cliffhanger, especially as a kid. You probably would have gone, "Oh my god!" But uh, as an adult reading it, it was very much like um, it was obviously a fake out. Um, I know that's what Goosebumps are famous for, but <laughs> uh, I didn't really like it. Um, my favourite cliffhanger, I have two, but one is classed as the end twist, so I usually talk about that separately. And my other favourite cliffhanger is when. Uh, Chris finally came face to face with Mr. Wood when she turned him around in the hallway after she woke him up. Um, I thought that was like a good, not necessarily a twist, but a, a good turning point in the story where finally, even though we've had this whole, the dummy might be alive since the start, <clears throat> but it turned out it was the sister playing it all along. 
I like the twist, or the, the cliffhanger, sorry, where she's finally face to face with the dummy, because that's kind of like, right, finally, things are kind of stepping up a notch, things are finally like accelerating to a point where shit's about to get real, swore again. Never going to get this video monetized at this rate, because I'm never going to remember to beep them all out, or oh, whatever, I like to swear, fuck it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just thought it was a nice moment where it'd be a good moment, like in the TV show, it would be great as a kid to read that. You're like, oh my god, the dummy's actually alive this time. Uh, but the end twist itself was really good as well. It's finally the introduction of Slappy. Um, it was. I would have loved to know, like I said before, what it was like to read this. I've never read any of the books before. Not knowing who Slappy was. Not knowing he was going to be this big thing. Because maybe when R.L. Stein wrote this, Slappy wasn't going to be a big thing, maybe. I don't know. Even though he is obviously in the next books as well. Did he know when he wrote this one he was going to bring Slappy back? We don't know. So this book is basically Mr. Wood book. Even though you just assume that the living dummy is going to be a part of Slappy. This book is very much a Mr. Wood book. Um, so yeah, I would have loved to know what it's like. If anyone's listening to this that's read it recently, having never read it before, not knowing much about Goosebumps, please let me know. Um, were you shocked by these twists? Because I feel like I would have been shocked as a kid to know A, that the sister was doing it, B, that it was Mr. Wood behind it all later on. And then C, that Slappy's alive as well. Um, yeah, I guess another point which I didn't talk about earlier on, which has kind of just come to mind, is if I only read this knowing nothing about the history of Slappy in later books, I would have to assume that the magic words in Mr. Wood's pocket wake awakens every dummy. Because it's never really explained why it uh, wakes both of them up. Although it does kind of mention, I guess, when they get both dummies together, they look sort of similar, like they're possibly from the same family. I guess that could be a one way. Yeah, it doesn't really say, oh, they, they both get woken up because they're from the same makers, I don't think. I don't know, whatever. Uh, but yeah, the end twist is really good, looking back on it, because it is the introduction to Slappy. It's like, finally, Slappy's alive. Yeah, baby. <laughs> um, in terms of the cover... I like the cover, um, it's a very simple cover, it's just Slappy's face, but in some ways that's the scarier, scariest part of it, because sometimes less is more, or just having this one static image of a dummy face, it's just really creepy, like, some of the scariest things in life are really simple, like darkness, sometimes can be really scary, so there's just one image of a face just watching you. Which plays on the whole fear of dummies and dolls. Where they have these eyes that are always following you. And they always look like they're watching you. So that cover really kind of freaked out a lot of people when they were kids. When this first came out. Because it is very relatable. Like this dummy face. Most people I know, even adults that I know now, are scared of dolls. Because I have like a Chucky doll in my bedroom. And my nephew who's eight makes me turn it around to face the wall. <laughs> when he comes to stay. Because he doesn't like to have it looking at him. I have friends who don't like it being in the same room when they go to sleep because it really freaks them out. So it's a very innate fear in humans of dolls and dummies coming to life. So yeah, I really like the cover. Um, I'm going to look at the English covers and the reprint covers probably in another book, uh, another re uh, video. Because the English covers have some different covers as well, as well as the, uh, the reprints. I was going to do them in each review, but uh, I'm probably going to change that. Um... So yeah, I like the cover. On to my review of the story. Um, uh, uh, let me see what I wrote down. Okay, my review of the story. I really like this book because it was quite a slow book. And by what I mean by slow is in some of the books that I read recently, the action moves really fast and sometimes that works depending on what the story is. Um, for example, I re reviewed a book called Fright Night and Ghost of Fear Street. I would definitely recommend you read that book because it gets goes from like 0 to 100 in the first few chapters and it never kind of lets up. It is fucking amazing because it's batshit crazy. Whereas this one is really slow in a good way. It really builds up a relationship between Chris and Lindy. It spends a long time talking about their feelings towards each other, their jealousy of each other, how they're supportive or not supportive, how they play pranks on each other. How one gets more popular and the other wants that popularity. So they make moves to become popular and the other's jealous of that. And how they clash a lot. 
And it really makes you, A, identify with these characters, and B, it makes you feel for them. It makes you feel sorry for Chris because she's getting left behind. But then also feel sorry for Lindy because at the same time, this is her thing. This is something she's good at, something she wants to do. So why should Chris kind of jump in on that bandwagon? So you're kind of like torn as you, as you read through about who to like and who not to like because you kind of see both sides of the coin. You see why Chris is jealous. You see why Lindy's annoyed, you know? And so it's very typical brother-sister behaviour or sister-sister behaviour or for me, brother-brother behaviour because I had a brother that I fought with a lot when I was a kid. So they're really relatable as characters, which you don't get a lot in some of the books these days because they don't spend a long time talking about their relationships. A lot of the time it is just very two-dimensional characters who may just have a, a trait, like they're a sports person, and somehow that helps them usually because they run fast, or they're intelligent, and that helps them because they figure things out quickly. Whereas this book has two really relatable characters that change and develop throughout the story. So when I say it moves slow, I mean it in a good way. Like it moves, things happen, there's cliffhangers, there's strange things happening. You're going round the twist. Sorry. <laughs> um, and so things happen at a fairly natural pace. It's got a really good pacing to this book because it slowly builds up. As we learn more about these characters and care about these characters, things start to get progressively more weird. Which culminates obviously in the fact that Lindy was behind most of it. Which is a really understandable twist at that point. In Revenge of the Living Dummy, it was a great twist because I didn't expect it. That the cousin was doing it. But it wasn't necessarily understandable because the cousin in that book was taking it to a level where it was like... He was pushing people downstairs and attacking old people physically. He was like mental and doing like really abusive things. And it was never explained why and why he would take it to that extreme. Whereas this book, it's understandable that Lindy is upset and angry and hurt and why she wants to kind of play pranks on her sister. And you get it. You might not like it, but you get it. You understand it. And so when it comes out that Lindy did it and why, fair enough, she, is, she just turned into a ha 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 ha. I am a villain and this is why I did it. Like in, sometimes in horror films, you have like a really innocent character. But as soon as you find out that they're a villain, they can completely change, which is never usually believable. Um, yeah, she it's understandable. She does take it to an extreme, of course. But she never, like, majorly hurts people, like Ethan did in Revenge. Um, so it's it makes sense. The twist makes sense. And isn't like a, what the hell? Like, why would that happen? You kind of go, Jesus, I didn't expect that. But fair enough, you know, I, I can see it was well planted throughout why why she did it, even if it wasn't agreeable. Um, so it, just, it moves at a good pace. Um, obviously, the dummy only comes alive towards the end. It doesn't take ages to kind of make his appearance known, which you wouldn't do if you were in a dummy's body or whatever, or you were alive and you were a dummy. You wouldn't spend ages, ages, ages kind of playing pranks. You would probably try and get into it fairly quickly, which Mr. Wood does. Um, it's obviously the introduction to Slappy, this book. So in some ways, you've got to love it for that. It does introduce everybody to the phenomenon that becomes Slappy. A lot of kids these days want, will only know really Slappy from the movie. Um, I prefer Slappy from the books than I do Slappy from the movie. Um, because I just find him more... Uh, not believable. Um, menacing, I guess. Like In the movie, I didn't find him that scary. He was like a bit of a wisecracker, which I guess Slappy is. But um, he, he wasn't that menacing in the movie, whereas in the books he is, and he does hurt people. Um, yeah, so you got to love the book for introducing Slappy. But like I mentioned before, I would, I would love to know what it was like to have read this as a kid and to not know about all the twists that were happening and how scary they were or how shocking they were. So please, if anybody knows anybody who's not read it, please give it to them. And see what they think, because I would I would love to know. Anyway, yeah, the book was good. It was a good pace, really good character developments, really a good villain in that it again the fact that the dummy is alive plays on a very innate fear of people about dolls and dummies and toys coming to life. Um, the villain's a bit um, I don't know what the word is, but for lack of a better term, twizzling his mustache, trying to lead it to a train tracks type of villain, like. But what I mean by that is he's very much shouting about how he's going to do all these bad things. 
but never actually gets a chance to do anything. I'm going to make you a slave. I'm going to use my non-existent magical powers. I'm going to do this. I'm going to hurt people. The only thing he actually does is strangle a dog, which, don't get me wrong, is awful. But that's not really much in the grand scheme of what he said he was going to do. So, the, although that the villain is pretty good still because of who he is and what he is. Um, so, overall, I really enjoyed the book. I have a few kind of issues with it, which kind of takes off a couple of points for me. But I'm still going to give this book an A. And that's for the reason of it is a classic Goosebumps book. Um, I, I was nervous reading it because I wanted to love it as much as I did as a kid. And I did. Great characters, great plot, great um, pacing. So a couple of little issues that could have been ironed out. Particularly just the magic powers more than anything else. Um, but other than that it was fantastic. Definitely a must read and definitely one I would recommend to anyone who's not read Goosebumps before. Or if you have and you haven't read this one, definitely read it. I don't know if you heard that, that's a really random noise that came from outside. <laughs> like a kazoo. Where? Whatever. Um, so yeah, that's my review of Goosebumps Night of the Living Dummy. My next review on the channel, I was debating going back to, to doing another Shivers, because I've not done that for a while. But I think I'm going to do Goosebumps again, and I'm going to do the only other one that I've read so far, which is The Abominable Snowman of Pasadena. And that one was chosen from me picking out a piece of paper from... A big bunch of books that I've got in a cup, which is all the books that I've got. And I just put the paper in a cup, pick one out, and it was about my little snowman of Pasadena. So yeah, thank you for tuning in, guys. Um, if you like this video, please me leave me a like or a comment, or please subscribe. I'd like to have more, some more subscribers. <laughs> um, uh, let me know what you think. Um, do you agree or do you not agree with what I've said? But yeah, until next time, guys. My name is Scott, and thank you for tuning in.